Hey everyone, Reese here, and welcome back to Control Alt Reese. And I thought I'd do something ever so slightly different with this video and take a look around this computer, uh, which of course is the Atari 800. And uh, this was in production from its launch in 1979, of course, alongside the 400, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, all the way up until 1992 um, in one form or another. So let's take a look around this and uh, see how it works, learn a little bit about its history and see how it all fits together. So the story of Atari's 8-bit home computer line starts in 1977, believe it or not, with the VCS, uh, which of course was their very first games console, uh, later went on to be known as the 2600 of course. And Atari's engineers at the time um, finished the design of that console and got it released and decided that uh, it, it didn't really have much longevity and that they should be uh, sort of uh, working on the next big thing uh, and working on its replacement. And that was going to be known as the 5200. Now, if you know much about uh, gaming history and Atari history, or even if you're just a regular viewer of this channel, you'll know that the 5200 was actually eventually released in 1982. But um, yes, um, it shares a lot in common with the 400 and the 800. In fact, it's essentially exactly the same machine with just some very, very minor changes in the uh, operating system. And the reason was that uh, Atari's engineers developed the 5200 and it turned out that the 2600 was actually still selling very, very strongly a couple of years later. And uh, there was a lot of interest in the market for a proper home computer. So they thought, okay, we'll take this architecture that we've designed, uh, we'll put the games console on hold and we'll just you know, design a keyboard and uh, some extra expansion capability into it and release it as a computer. And the product was this, and of course the 400. So the uh, 800 and the 400 both released at the same time, uh, back in 1979, like I said. Uh, the 800 has a proper full travel uh, keyboard, the 400 had a membrane keyboard and the reason for the numbering is essentially that the 400 was going to release with 4k of ram and the 800 was going to release with 8k of ram now i say going to uh, as it happens as they were approaching the sort of final months towards the launch ram prices massively came down and atari took the very wise decision of releasing both machines with 8k of ram so uh, these both rolled off the production line in 1979 with 8k of ram which was a lot at the time and of course they're very easily uh, upgradable and expandable as we'll find out. The other difference is under this little slot here or flap shall I say uh, and we have the two cartridge ports here on the 800. The 400 only had the one cartridge port and uh, actually later 8-bit computers from Atari would only have the one cartridge port so this is the only machine that had the two and we'll talk a little bit more about those uh, a bit later on in the video. So I think we should start by taking a look around the outside. Now, on the front of the 800, we have four joystick con controller ports. And these are the same 9-pin joystick ports as the 2600 console, and they support joysticks and paddles, of course. So here are the paddle controllers, and as you can see, we have two paddles to one connector. Now, this was, of course, used on the 2600. You could have four paddles connected, and I believe uh, Warlords supported up to four paddle controllers simultaneously. And you're probably thinking, well, hang on a second, surely with the four joystick ports, that means I could connect eight paddles to this thing. And you're absolutely right, it does support eight paddles. Uh, and there was one game, Super Breakout, which uh, did support eight players with eight paddles. Um, I'm not going to be able to demo that right now for obvious reasons, but um, yeah, just a really interesting technical aside um, relating to the Atari 800. So just continuing to have a look around the outside of this machine, uh, there's not much going on at all on the left hand side, in fact there are no ports at all on there, so that's an easy one. On the back, originally would have been the RF cable to connect it to a TV, now I've removed that from mine because uh, obviously uh, we don't use RF in this day and age and uh, NTSC RF TVs are pretty rare in this part of the world anyway, so uh, that was surplus to requirements. And that was just hard hardwired, very similar, in a very similar way to the 2600. And on this side is the business end. So, as you can see, we have a monitor connector. Uh, so there's a monitor connector there, uh, the SIO port, the channel selector for the RF output, the power switch, and the uh, power adapter socket, uh, which is a 9 volt AC adapter. So the monitor port is quite interesting, that supports composite video natively, uh, so of course in this day and age uh, no need for that RF output at all and no need to modify these for composite output which is really nice. Um, 
SIO is often considered a predecessor to USB and it was actually a really, really clever um, idea on Atari's part and it's something that was supported on all of these 8-bit machines all the way from this, this connector's invention in 1979 up to the last machines off the production line in 1992, so really long-lived and um, yeah, supported... I actually can't find any record um, of the maximum theoretical maximum number of devices um, that were supported by SIO but essentially you could daisy chain all of your hardware together um, so you could have disk drives, you could have printers, you could have modems and uh, all sorts of other bits of hardware and uh, just um, yeah, just connect it all together and it would automatically configure and the software would be able to talk to it and uh, yeah, really, uh, really ahead of its time. And of course this was before uh, things like um, your RS-232 and parallel ports and stuff like that were standardised. So, uh, yeah, very uh, interesting and very forward-thinking uh, thing by Atari's engineers. So we will take a look under the cartridge flap, I think. And uh, as mentioned earlier, we have the left cartridge and the right cartridge. And I'll just show you what the cartridges look like. So this is Defender, the uh, famous uh, arcade conversion, really excellent version of this game. And uh, that just, like I say, just plugs straight into the cartridge port, nothing too exciting there. Uh, and these all say left cartridge on them. Now the interesting thing is that the left cartridge and the right cartridge slots were mapped to different addresses in memory. And um, yeah, pretty much everything that was ever released was released as a left cartridge. And Atari did eventually drop the right cartridge slot completely because, well, because nothing used it. So, uh, yeah, it's a bit uh, surplus to requirements. And uh, I can't actually think of anything um, that used the right cartridge slot at all. And because of the way these were mapped in memory, uh, you couldn't just, if you plug that into the right cartridge slot, although it would physically fit, um, it wouldn't actually load and it wouldn't, uh, wouldn't do anything. So, yeah, it's interesting how the cartridges were actually designed for a specific slot. So this top panel is actually removable and there's actually something very interesting in here. So let's take these screws out and I will show you what's going on. So a very easy machine to take apart. Uh, you literally just need a uh, sort of medium to large size uh, Phillips or Posi drive type screwdriver. So that's all I'm gonna be using. But yes, once these two screws are removed, this panel just lifts out, pulls forwards. And as we can see, there are some PCBs in here. So can you guess what they are? Well, we will take a look and I will show you. So these are 16K RAM boards and these are quite dusty. And one of the things I want to do uh, in taking this computer apart is get it nice and clean inside as well. But yes, these are 16K RAM cards. So that's one of them. And that's another 16K. So that's uh, 32K uh, in total so far. And then we have another 16K, which takes us up to the machine's maximum RAM of 48K. Now, it wasn't me that uh, upgraded this, so evidently whoever owned this um, back in the day, so to speak, um, fully upgraded it, which is nice to see, or evidently it was, uh, it was used um, and enjoyed and appreciated and uh, yeah, maximum uh, maximum RAM installed in this computer. But the really interesting thing is this card here. So I'll just very carefully extract this. And this card is marked OS. And the reason for that is because this is the brains of the operation. This is the card that contains the operating system in ROM. And uh, if we have a look at these chips, we can see that they date to uh, 1981. Uh, 1981, 1982. So that kind of dates this computer to uh, 1982 at the earliest, which uh, sounds about right. And uh, probably explains why it was fully upgraded as well. I think uh, to, I think Atari did actually sell these eventually uh, just as a 48k machine with all of these slots fully populated. Now you'll also notice the moulding around these slots is kind of shaped. And the reason for that is that uh, when these were very first released, these memory cards actually came in a plastic casing, very similar to a cartridge. And uh, it, they were actually causing the RAM chips to overheat. So Atari dropped the casing uh, and just had the cards just slot in and, and kind of stay kind of loose in the slots. Um, so yeah, just uh, 
interesting uh, revision to the hardware there. And uh, as you can see, um, these slots are all on a bus. Uh, there is another internal card as well, which of course I'll show you when we take this apart, which is a really interesting one. And uh, yeah, similar to uh, like an old mini computer or a PDP, that kind of thing. Uh, and an architecture that of course these microcomputers kind of moved away from uh, very shortly after this uh, with everything being integrated onto the motherboard. Uh, for example, the Atari ST, which I have here, which uh, obviously that was first released in 1985 uh, and didn't have any internal expansion slots at all. Uh, but this thing is all completely modular, hence the OS, the RAM, uh, and as we'll see, some other very important chips being on the same bus and being fully interchangeable, which is a really cool design. So it's time to turn this over and take a look at its bottom. What an absolute unit, right. So as we can see, we have the uh, handwritten serial number sticker on the bottom still, uh, 9472301. I don't know how many of these were manufactured over the years and if that's a particularly uh, early or noteworthy one. Uh, we also have this, this is actually uh, stamped into the case, I presume with something hot that's actually melted those numbers in. So that's uh, obviously an asset tag or something like that. Maybe it belonged to a school. Um, I don't really know the history of this specific machine, but um, very common, of course, in those days, uh, security marking. And yeah, we have the uh, manufactured by Atari Inc, Sunnyvale, California. And uh, this is quite interesting as well, an interesting part of Atari history because their early machines were manufactured in California at their Sunny Sunnyvale plant. Um, and it was later on that Atari actually started to outsource their manufacturing to places like Malaysia and Taiwan. So interesting to see that uh, Sunnyvale sticker on this machine. And to Atari collectors, the Sunnyvale models are actually worth uh, quite a bit more because, of course, they're kind of the uh, the OG machines, um, you know, made in those very early days of Atari. So to take the lid off, we just need to remove uh, one, two, three, four, five screws. So let's do that now. So yet again, very similar to the uh, 2600 or VCS, uh, this is in a huge, very substantial metal box. Uh, and the reason for that being the fact that this has an RF modulator inside it and the uh, requirements for the emissions requirements um, set by the FCC back in the 1970s uh, were incredibly strict on anything that uh, would leak RF radiation uh, in the same sort of bands as TV equipment um, and so Atari's solution was to just wrap everything in solid metal boxes. Uh, some of the other earlier computers uh, just just released with matching monitors um, rather than including that RF modulator uh, but the RF modulator and the fact that this could be connected to a standard TV uh, was of course a big factor in its success as a platform and uh, something that would continue on to uh, later machines like the ST and uh, and the uh, Amiga and, and, and all of those kind of things that, um, that followed it. Um, obviously by that point the uh, FCC had relaxed those requirements and were a bit less scared of people connecting stuff to their TVs uh, and so the internal shielding in those isn't anywhere near as substantial as one of these. So inside we can see a speaker. Now if you're familiar with uh, stuff like the ZX Spectrum you'd be forgiven for thinking that maybe this is the uh, only audio capability of this machine. Um, but actually, as far as I know, this this is just a beeper that just beeps when you very first turn the computer on. Um, and then that's it. Um, all of the audio is uh, piped out through the uh, through the, uh, the connector on the side, um, which also handles the video signals and stuff as well, uh, or through to the uh, TV, of course, using the uh, modulator. So uh, yeah, nice little speaker, but um, spends the vast majority of its time doing absolutely nothing. So there's also this uh, quality control sticker that was just uh, rattling around inside. Um, evidently that was stuck to the inside of the case at one point or maybe to uh, one of these PCBs. I can't quite see what that says on it. Um, probably the initials of, is that VE? Yeah, probably the initials of whoever tested this and uh, signed it off when it came off the production line all those years ago. So to take the top case off, we need to remove at least these two screws. Um, but I think what I'm going to do is actually just remove all of these screws just because they need to come out anyway just to, to take this thing apart. So I will do that now. So next up, of course, we need to take the top case off and that is just a case of flipping this over and very carefully disconnecting the keyboard. 
So this just hinges up forwards like so. And the keyboard is connected via this ribbon cable. And these old ribbon cables are quite fragile, but I want to take this apart anyway to give it a thorough clean. So I'll just very carefully pull this out. And that's the keyboard assembly. Uh, nothing too exciting there, but it is a nice, really nice tactile uh, mechanical keyboard assembly. So uh, yeah, hats off to Atari there. I know there were some later home micros that uh, weren't quite so lucky. Um, and I'll just turn this around so I can see what's going on. And there we go. So yes, on this side of the board, I think that's the RF modulator there. Uh, we have some really big capacitors. Um, like I said, the uh, actual power supply to this is external and it's a, a nine volt uh, AC PSU. So we can see the four diodes of the uh, rectifier there, which obviously converts that to DC. Um, I believe this uses, ah oh yes, there we go. So we've got uh, 12 volts um, and uh, 5A and 5B. So 12 and 5 volts internally, just like uh, many computers that would precede it. So yes, uh, we can see all of the uh, diodes here that we have on the uh, joystick connectors. That's quite interesting just for uh, protection purposes. So this is designed in the form of multiple boards. Uh, so we've got the power and the uh, switches on this board here, which of course comes off and I'll take that off in a second. And then we've got the actual sort of motherboard um, backplane type arrangement underneath. So let's remove a few more screws and uh, start to get to the bottom of this. So there is a connector along here which connects the top board to the bottom board and it's just a case of very carefully easing this upwards and then that comes off and I'll just place this to one side and hopefully this part should now come off. And that is quite a substantial block of aluminium. I assume that's aluminium, it's quite light. Um, but yes, really substantial that. That's got to be a good um, four millimeters thick in places. In fact, along this bot bottom edge, um, probably uh, probably two millimeters, two or three millimeters. So yeah, wow, that's uh, quite a uh, sturdy chassis. So now we're actually getting down to the nitty gritty and the actual brains behind the operation. And as you can see, the uh, motherboard itself isn't really all that complicated. Uh, it's kind of dominated by these passive components, uh, these resistors and diodes. And all these do is uh, basically uh, filter the input. I think these, a lot of these will be pull-up resistors as well for the uh, joystick inputs. Uh, so they filter the inputs from the keyboard and the uh, joysticks slash uh, spinners. Um, and uh, basically pass that all on to this chip here, which I believe is a PIA chip, um, which of course translates all of those incoming signals from the keyboard and from the other input devices, uh, and also handles um, serial communications and, and that kind of stuff as well. So uh, off the shelf component there, that's a uh, MOS um, 3179 it says on it. Uh, the Atari part number is CO14795. Um, but the interesting chip on this board is this, which is the Pokey chip. And this is one of three custom chips on this machine. And uh, yeah, the uh, Pokey sound chip, which is unique to the Atari 8-bit computers. And uh, in my opinion, one of the uh, most iconic uh, computer sound chips of all time. Uh, so towards the back of the motherboard, we have the uh, just the timing crystal here. This is the main system clock. Um, the NTSC machines are actually clocked slightly faster than the PAL machines. Uh, this is an NTSC machine, so this will be a 1.79 megahertz machine as opposed to the PAL's uh, 1.77 megahertz. Um, obviously, back in those days, the video timing was all tied in with the actual system clock and everything else. So, uh, yeah, that explains the difference in that. But one thing we haven't come across yet is any kind of video chip or indeed the CPU. So where are they hiding? Well, I'm sure the uh, eagle-eyed among you have probably spotted this card at the back. So let's just turn this around. And yet again, another part of this very forward-thinking modular architecture. Uh, we've got the main CPU board here on the back. So I will just very carefully extract this, or not, as the case may be. Oh, uh, just before we look at this, very interesting to see this edge connector here, which uh, actually is 
um, completely obscured and obstructed when the computer is fully assembled. So I'm not quite sure what their plan was for that. Um, that would be very interesting to know. So uh, that's something that I'm going to have to look into. Um, evidently part of the same uh, system bus as everything else. So uh, yeah, I wonder what uh, what potential plans they had for that connector. But anyway, at the moment we are looking at the CPU board. So uh, yes, if we look at the date codes on these, um, I can't see any date codes on the uh, those two chips, but this one is a Rockwell uh, 6502 CPU. Uh, of course, the CPU that would go on to power the likes of the uh, Commodore 64 and the BBC Micro and uh, lots of other really iconic machines of the 1980s, 8-bit uh, CPU that, uh, as I said before, clocked at 1.79 megahertz. Uh, and the date code on this particular one is 8304, so that's week 4 of 1983, which uh, I think is uh, pretty definitively dates this machine. Uh, this card uh, was probably... Uh, yeah, I think this this is the highest date I've found so far, so uh, evidently a, a 1983 machine. And the other two chips on this board are, of course, the other two custom chips uh, designed for the Atari 8-bit computers, which are actually designed by J Minor. So we've got the Antic chip, uh, which is this one, uh, and we've got the GTIA, which is this one, or it may be a CTIA, I'm not quite sure. Um, the TIA, or, or Television Interface Adapter Chips, uh, were essentially what took the output output from the uh, Antic chip, which is uh, essentially the, the graphics chip, um, and obviously turned that into a signal that could be displayed on a TV. Um, started life with the Atari VCS uh, back in 1977 as the TIA, or Television Interface Adapter Chip, and then uh, it was... Uh, improved a couple of times within its lifetime. So there was the CTIA and then the GTIA. Um, I think the GTIA came later uh, with the XL and XE machines. So I think this is probably a CTIA. Um, that's probably something I should have looked up before I started, but anyway. So yeah, that's kind of the brains of the machine, uh, the CPU, the graphics chip, and the television interface adapter. So I think that pretty much covers the uh, architecture and uh, some of the history of the Atari 800 and of course these Atari 8-bit machines. Uh, really fantastic computers. Uh, if you have any memories of them yourself or uh, anything that you want to add about the uh, about the system and how it all works, um, please do let me know down in the comments. It's really, really great to learn uh, even more about this stuff. But I think I'm gonna leave it at that for now. So yeah, thank you very much for joining me for this teardown. I hope you found it very interesting. Um, I'm gonna go away now and clean all of these parts up just so this is lovely and shiny and new, and then I'm gonna put it back together. But uh, I don't expect you to sit through all of that bit as well. So uh, yes, um, thank you very much for joining me and hopefully I'll see you again next time.